got to find my scripture. It's not real far in the Bible, not hard to find. But we are in Genesis chapter 2 today. Glory to God. We're out of Genesis 1 and we're into Genesis 2. We're making headway. <clears throat> we're actually going to finish up our creation story today. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 1. We'll go through verse 3 says this thus the heavens and the earth were finished i know you guys were all wanting to say god said i know you were <laughs> go ahead and say it anyway say god said <laughs> thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them matter of fact i love that statement and all the host of them we're, we're going to get to that in a little bit because it's so so good the meaning behind it in its original text and on the seventh day god finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation father we thank you for your work we thank you for your creation we thank you that you created us in your image and in your likeness that you have separated us that you have sanctified us, that you have called us to be a, a holy nation in a royal priesthood separated for your glory. We thank you for that today, Father. And Lord, I just pray that today every heart here would be blessed with the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we can know you better, so that we can know your intentions towards us, so that we can see, God, that the Sabbath was created for us, not us for the Sabbath. It's so important to know that, that God, today we would find rest in your love, rest in what you have already done for us. I pray that over each and every one of us today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. Before you're seated, give your neighbor a hug and tell him, say, rest in love, rest in love. Come on. Yeah. CWC. Come on, if you are here in the building this morning, go ahead and say, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, I love it. Well, then let's try another one. If you're ready for a word, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Amen. You people are on it today. I love it. I love it. Listen, welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I hope I don't frighten any of you today with my excitement. So I tell you what, look at your neighbor, see who you're sitting by, and if you don't have confidence in them that they'll comfort you when you need comforted, you've got a free ticket to move. If find somebody you will have confidence in, amen. <clears throat> well, I know I am excited because, man, the Lord has, has got us launched into a series that we have titled The Saga of Salvation, The Saga of Salvation. And we are in one series for the entire year, but within that one series, we have a bunch of different scenes that we're going to go through throughout God's word. And we're going to see how it all points to the saga of salvation, how it's all leading us and pointing us to Jesus. Every single one of the scriptures, every single scene throughout the scripture is pointing us to one name, the name that is above every other name, and his name is Jesus, trying to guide us into the story of salvation because it says this in scripture, that God doesn't desire for one to perish, but that all would come to repentance, to the saving knowledge of who Jesus is, to this wonderful name of Jesus. And so, man, I'm excited about this series, The Saga of Salvation. Now, we started off the series with the story of creation, right? And we started in the first book of the first chapter of the Bible in Genesis with the creation story. And today, we're actually going to finish it up. How many of you are excited we are finished with creation story? Calm down. I got one clap. That's good. I didn't want to hear a bunch. I was going to become very insecure and you'd have to no, I know my wife's like, come on, man, let's go. Let's go, dude. Like, yeah, I mean, you've been in creation long enough. I'm like, honey, we could spend a whole year in creation, really. But no, but today is day seven, which happens to be scene seven, which seven is the number of completion. And so I find it very fitting, right, to finish this thing up with God's completed work 
of his creation. How he completed everything in the heavens and the earth. And then on the seventh day, he rested. Now, now one of the things that I find to be so cool about this, this creation story, something that's so amazing to me is how God's creativity is on full display for the entire world to see. It's amazing. It's amazing. Listen, before day one took place, the earth was formless and it was void. There was nothing and it had absolutely nothing. But see, God created something where there once was nothing all out of his own creativity. This is what creation shows us, this, this creativity of God's in full swing and full effect that, that actually, you know what, that there's no way for us to measure it. It's, it's, it's a vast measure of his, his creativity, but you and I can't measure this because we have nothing com to compare it to. Nothing to compare it to. We've never been confronted with something so great and so majestic than, than God's creation. It's hard to measure something if the something that you're trying to measure compares to nothing else you can see or measure it by. For instance, let me illustrate it this way. We know a building is big or small. How? Because we compare it to other buildings. God's creation, there's no way to measure his creativity. It's so great and so amazing. And we find in Genesis chapter one, it starts off and it's showing God painting this beautiful masterpiece on a completely blank canvas. I mean, here God is, right? He's pulling colors off the color wheel, even though a color on a color wheel doesn't even exist yet. He is handcrafting people, places, and things, even though the, thing that, the things that he is crafting has never been crafted before he crafted them. It's incredible. His creativity is displayed through his creation. And that's why I always say, man, that I think that the people of God should be the most creative people on the entire planet because their heavenly father is the one that created creativity. It's amazing to see his creation and how awesome it is. And so day one marks the start of his creation, which launches off into his creativity. But now of all of us get to enjoy every single day and see and walk in and partake in. And, and so we, we launched in this creation story. Now, if you remember, how many of you here were for day one, scene one? How many of you were here? Sweet. Okay. The church was full back then, but four of you were here. Awesome. So look. <laughs> Amen. But we launched this thing off with day one and day four. We combined these two days because I loved the compare and contrast. I, listen, in scripture, I always try to find friction points, right? I like the friction points in scripture. I like it where it rubs us and it's like, what is that? It's challenging because it, it, it brings to life something. It gives a new revelation to, to what God is trying to speak. So I look for these friction points. And so day one and day four is a great friction point. Because day one, he says, let there be light. But on day four, he says, let there be lights. What is that? What does that mean? And so we, we preach the first day and then day four together to prove and to show kind of what God was meaning there. And day one, he says, let there be light. And what we, we talked about there was how God was illuminating this earth by injecting his son Jesus into this dark and lonely place. He's speaking his word which by the way is Jesus. Remember, Revelation chapter 19 says, the name by which Jesus is called is the word of God. John chapter one, verse 14 says it another way. It says that the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is the word of God. And if the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, leading me straight to him, well, then we see that in day one, when he says, let there be light, he's, he's speaking his word, which is his son, into this, into this world. That's what we see with day one. Then in day four, he says, let there be lights, which is, is weird. He already said, let there be light. Why say, let there be lights, right? Why well, say that? And what we talked about is how on day four, he creates the sun, the moon, and the stars, which are here to help navigate us through our everyday walk on this earth. And, and not only are they here to navigate, to help us navigate this earth, but they're, they are also here to govern our days and our nights, to govern our times and our, our seasons. And so that's what we talked about. Light and lights was the title of that message. So, so in day one, God says, let there be light. And he's, 
He's actually taking care of our eternity. Then on day four, he says, let there be lights. And this is where God is taking care of our temporary. And one of the things that I felt like the Lord spoke to, to me in that to, to bring out and to highlight to all of us is, is the fact that he, he desires so much and he wants so much to spend eternity with us. He wants it so bad because he loves us so much. And so he makes sure he takes care of the eternity before the temporary. Because he's like, man, I gotta get this thing solidified for my creation. I love them. I wanna spend forever with them. And so let me, let, let me take care of that and, and go ahead and inject my son into this, into this world. It's incredible. Then on day two, we see how God separates the heavens from the earth. He separates the waters from the waters. And the message there we titled, Preparation for Inhabitation. Preparation for Inhabitation. Now, listen, really quickly. I wanna take an opportunity here to to correct a mistake I made in that message, okay? So when I got home that day, I asked my wife, I said, hey, babe, how'd I do? I do it every single week, okay? Every week, she's my barometer, right? Sometimes she'll say, hey, babe, should have left that one in the vault. Should have stayed locked up in the prayer closet. I'm just saying. Other times she'll say, you crushed it. You did great. And man, that feels really good, right? So I'm like, thanks, honey. Like, you know what I mean? So I know she's gonna shoot me straight. She spares none of my feelings, doesn't really care about any of that, right? She figures I got a nursing back to health anyway. So, and so that day was like, no, you know, no different from any other day. And I said, hey, babe, how'd I do? And she said, well, you made a mistake. I said, oh, okay, well, well what was it? She said, well, you know, because during that message, I gave the story about the dog. How many remember the dog story? Yeah. She says, yeah, well, you, you, you know that, that a, a puggle is a beagle and a pug mix. I said, yeah, I know that. She said, okay, then why did you say it was a poodle and a pug mix? I said, my bad. I'm sorry. She's like, well, get your facts straight, dude. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're making us look bad up there. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, my bad, babe. So I stand corrected. Stay corrected. Also, one more thing. So I had a ton of people come up to me and say, hey, um, what happened to the dog? <laughs> Is the dog still alive? I'm like, oh my gosh. So, so just because I wasn't prepared for the dog doesn't mean I killed the dog, for God's sake. Like, <laughs> right? The dog is good. She's well. She's living a full life in doggy years and, and has a great home. We gave her to some friends. But anyway, now that all of that... <laughs> Come on, somebody. They probably are taking care of the dog way better than we could have. Hallelujah. But the dog is alive and it's well. We did not kill it, even though we weren't prepared for it. Back to the recap. <clears throat> so day two, we talked about preparation for inhabitation. And we talked about how God prepared this earth. And I used that story to articulate we prepare for the things that we're ready to care for. And how we weren't prepared for the dog. And so we weren't ready to care for the dog. But see, God isn't like us, God. He prepared the earth because he cares for us. He, he prepared the earth for us to inhabit the earth. And, and he also prepared the earth for us to inhabit the earth so that he could inhabit us. Preparation for inhabitation. Another thing that the Lord showed us in that that I thought was really, really good is, is how he, at creation, he separated the heavens from the earth. But then through his son, Jesus, he caused the heavens to invade earth. That's awesome. That's awesome. He torn the veil. He invaded the earth with heaven so that we could enter into the holy of holies. And this is where God inhabits us. Preparation for inhabitation. Then day three, Pastor Micah brought a word called formed to fill. And we've seen how God, he, he filled the earth. He formed it, then he filled it with all the vegetation and the dry land and the seas. And, and so if God had, had formed the earth to fill the earth, then we know that God would have formed us to fill us. Amen. 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 He desires for us to live a full life. A full life in the, in the power of his spirit. And so he wants to fill us with his spirit. And so that was day three, formed to fill. And then... Remember, we, we combined day one and day four. So now we're day five and day six. We talked about that last week with the message titled, Created to Contribute. Created to Contribute. And we, we talked about how God created this entire earth for us, right? Everything on it was for our good and his glory, 
right? He filled it with all the vegetation and all the, the, the animals and the, and the sea and, and all that stuff. He was, he was creating it so that we could be filled upon this earth. But see, he was creating us to fill us. And so then because we see that and realize what all God done for us, we are to be a people who aren't always asking God, God, what can you do for me? But instead, we're a people saying, God, what can we do for you? What can we do? How can we use our gifts? How can we, we use our talents? What gift can we bring to you, my king, to help advance your kingdom so that your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? I'm not talking about when I get to eternity. I'm talking about right now. How can I advance your kingdom here? on this earth because we want to be a people for your glory Jesus that's the type of people that we desire to be and hunger to be and seek after to be and and so God used me and so we talked about how we are created to contribute not to just consume but the world tries to turn us into consumers it's all about us it's what I want what I need right and consumers always become complainers contributors become people who have input in where we're headed so that we can get there more effectively with the least amount of pain as possible. Amen. I like to go through life with a little bit of pain, not a whole lot. And so we surround ourselves with wise counsel because there's wisdom in the multitude of counsel. And so when we're contributors, man, we, we bring an input to how can we do this thing better together. Amen. Amen. Created to contribute. Day one through day six, quick recap for you. Now we get to day seven. Day seven, and I titled this, Rest in Love. Come on, look at your neighbor. Say, Rest in Love. Rest in Love. In Genesis chapter two, verse one, this is what it says. It says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. So look, man, now God's creativity is reality. On day seven, it's a reality. It's no longer just an idea that he's discussing with his son and with his spirit. It's reality. And now it's finished. It's, it's completed. And, and he's looking at all that he created, right? And, he, and he's taking pleasure. And how many of you have dreams and ideas that you you discuss with the people closest to you? How many of you? Yeah, most of us, I hope, dream and discuss things with those closest to you. I know Julie and I, man, we do this all the time. We dream together. We discuss ideas together. And, and I can remember when we were dreaming about this church and about the ministry. And we were dreaming about this, man, and we were discussing ideas on how we felt like the Lord was going to cause this thing to look, right? We were constantly doing it and look we still have a ton of dreams and a ton of discussions matter of fact it's every day (laughs) she's always trying to help me do better (laughs) amen and so we're constantly discussing but but here's the thing there's a lot of dreams and ideas that have now come to fruition the reality they're no more ideas They're, they're no longer ideas or discussions they their reality. And me and Julie now, we get to look back and we get to see what all God has done in our personal lives and in our kids' lives and in the, in the ministry that he is, he's blessed us with. And, and so we get to sit back and say, wow, God, you are amazing. And we get to rest and look at it and say, you're awesome, Jesus. I cannot believe what all you have done. And see, when I was reading this, this is how I, how I was reading it. See, listen to me. When you read God's word, you're not just to read a story. You're to cause a story to be revealed to your heart. And you do that a lot. Well, let me tell you how I do it. I inject myself into the story. How would I be? Just so I can wrap my mind around what is happening at this point. And so when I'm reading this, right, I have to think that before God created all that he created, maybe, just maybe, he would have been dreaming with his son about day seven. He would have been discussing with his Holy Spirit all the wonderful ideas that he had for this earth and for us. Maybe, I I mean, I don't know because it doesn't tell me, but but maybe, just maybe, God the Father, God the the Son, and 
God the Holy Spirit spent countless hours and countless days and countless weeks talking about what they would do on this earth and what this earth would look like. Talking about what they would do for us and how we would look like them. And then finally, day seven arrives. It's here. And he says, thus the heavens and the earth are finished. No longer is this an idea or a dream, it's reality. It's reality, and here they are, right? They, they got their feet kicked up. It says this, that heaven is their throne and the earth is their footstool. And so they got their feet kicked up and they're back relaxing and just chilling, looking at all that they had created and thinking, man, this is so good. Look how good this is. And in the very next statement, it's amazing. It says this, and all the host of them. Thus, the heavens and the earth were created and were finished, and all the host of them. And the reason that I love this so much is because of the meaning behind it. See, in the original uh, Hebrew, I almost said Greek, it's Hebrew. (laughs) In the original Hebrew context, it means this, a military armament arranged in a marching order. (laughs) So good. So good, because this is what this is saying. God the Father, God the the Holy Spirit, they're they're all kicked back on their heavenly thrones with the earth as their footstool and they're they're admiring their dreams that are now reality. They're, They're so excited about these ideas that now have come to fruition. And they see that everything they created were marching to the beat of their drum. So cool. Moving in the direction that God created them all to move. Everything created perfectly marching in perfect harmony. Heaven and earth, each of them marching together. Marching together. Coming together as one in service to the one that created them out of, the, out of his creativity. It's incredible. What an amazing picture. It says that all the heavens and all the earth rejoice and sing praises to God. And God is sitting back and he's watching all of this unfold on the seventh day and he's, he's resting and all the host of them, everything marching to the beat of his drum. You and I were never meant to march to the beat of our own drums. You know how you hear that cliche? Well, he marches to the beat of his own drum. That's a bad thing. People take that as a compliment. No, that's bad, dude. Like, that's not good. Like, yeah, I'm marching. No, no, you shouldn't march to the beat of your own drum. That's a scary thing if you have your own moral compass. We see that in the world today. People with their own moral compasses, all screwed up, can't even guide them to the parking lot. <laughs> like, don't march to the beat of your own drum. You know, there's these new cl- cliches out right now. I hate cliches, by the way. But anyway, these new cliches. It says, live your best life. Be your best you. I'm like, no. Live the life he called you to live. <laughs> be the you he created you to be. Be that. But here it is, right? God says, And all the host of them are marching to the beat of the drum that I had set forth when I spoke my word to create them. And then on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. You know, when I was reading this, I began to think about rest And I begin to think how most of us would probably interpret that word rest. Because most of us would associate words like vacation with rest. Doing nothing must mean resting. (laughs) Right? Sitting on the beach has to be resting. Now, I'm not going to mention Disney in this category. Because no sane person (laughs) with the right mind in their brain, right, like, can say that that is a vacation. There's nothing resting about that. That's vacation on steroids, man. And anything shot with steroids isn't resting, I promise you. I've met some dudes in the gym. Like, they ain't resting ever. Like, <laughs> that type of vacation needs a vacation from the vacation. It's in its own category. So I'm not, Disney's, yeah, praise God. I'm scarred by it every time I go. Like, I got like agoraphobia, right? Like, all these crowds. But anyway, so I won't mention Disney, but most of us associate resting with doing nothing. But that's not what God associates resting with. See, it wasn't like God got to the last day on the seventh day and he was all wiped out from the work that he did for the first six days. 
like we do, right? Like we get all tired, we're done, we worked hard all week, which is, yeah, great. We're wiped out, let's take a day where we do nothing, right? God wasn't like that. Matter of fact, I'll prove it to you. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 says this. Do you not know, have you not heard that God is the everlasting God? The Lord is the everlasting God. He never grows tired or weary, right? Youths, they grow tired and weary and young men, they stumble and fall. But those who wait upon the Lord, he will renew even their strength. So God never grows tired. He, he wasn't exhausted. He wasn't exhausted. Well, then why, why would you rest if you're not exhausted? Why, why would God have to rest? Well, he goes on to tell us in verse three. He says, so God blessed it. He blessed the seventh day and made it holy. This is why he rested. The reason God had, had rested is because he blessed it and called it holy. And, and when something or someone is holy, it means that that something or someone is separated. It's set apart. It's different than everything and anything else. It's different. And that's what the Sabbath day was declared. It was declared as something different. It's the it's the Sabbath. It was always meant to be, to be a holy day, separated from all the other days, where instead of striving to get what we need to get done, we, we rest in the presence of who God is. Hebrews chapter four, verse nine and 10 says it this way. It says, there remains a Sabbath day, Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his work as God rested from his own. Sabbath is meant for us to rest in the Lord. Instead of going after and striving to, to build something here on this earth, we, we use that day. We choose to set that day aside to, to spend with the Lord for all that he has already done for us. Now, look, when I was <clears throat> preparing this message, I was talking to the Lord, like, how can I illustrate this message, God, what you did for us in the Sabbath day through your son, Jesus? And this was the, the story that came to my heart and my mind. The story about my son, Abishai. God brought this back to my remembrance. See, a while back, my son was diagnosed with this rare stomach disease. That's how the, the doctor characterized what was happening with him. Now, before the diagnosis, right, came all the different doctor's appointments. And we were in and out of the doctor's office multiple, multiple times. Because he was really, really sick, man. High fevers really sick, couldn't eat anything. And then, then all of a sudden when he would try to eat something, he would double over in pain and he would start throwing up and his fever would spike again. And this, this went on for day after day after day. And every time we'd go into the doctor's office, the doctor would say, well, it's just a bug. It's just gotta run its course. And finally, after I heard that three or four times, I said, oh, whoa, whoa, hold up, hold up. Mm, we're, we're not, no. No, I want some tests ran on him. I, something's up with him. I just wanna make sure as a, as a parent, you know, probably thought I was a crazy lunatic. They're like, no, let's run tests. And, and I don't care what tests you got to do, do whatever you got to do to show me that there's, that there's nothing wrong because I just sensed something was wrong. And so the doctor was super gracious, right? She was like, okay, all right, sir, it's a good idea. Let's send him for an ultrasound. Let's, let's see if there's something happening. And so we do that, right? We leave, we go to this other place to get these this ultrasound done and, and they tell us go ahead and, and head home and we'll call you with the results so we we take off Jules and I and Abishai we're driving back we pull into Tyrone and as soon as we pulled in the doctor calls and says hey where are you guys at well we just pulled into Tyrone okay great are, are you near your your home yes we're we're near our home okay run and, and go get some clothes and and rush back here because your son has a rare stomach disease and it's probably gonna require a surgery. And so you guys will be in the hospital for a few days. So, so run home quickly and throw you know, some clothes in a bag and get back here. Now look, if the doctor would have knew who she was dealing with, she would have omitted certain details. So, because as soon as the only thing I heard in that whole thing was your son is sick and you gotta get him back. I didn't hear anything else, right? I did go to my house, but I packed a bag that looked like a small child who couldn't even walk packed. Like, you know what I mean? Like, underwear, socks, and a toothbrush, some random stuff. Like, you know what I mean? Like, because I had to get back to my truck. I had to get my son 
to the, to the hospital. And so, bam, I run back. I can think of nothing else but him. And, and so on my way to State College, right, I'm driving to State College. And on the side of the road, ever so often, there's these white signs there, right? And they got black letters and numbers on them. It says speed limit, 70 miles per hour. And we all know that if we go over that number, we're breaking the law. We're breaking the law. I have to admit, I'll be very transparent with you. I wasn't worried about the speed limit sign or breaking that law. I wasn't worried about it because my son was sick. The only thing I was worried about was getting my son to the doctor safely, but as fast as I possibly could. And, and those signs didn't mean anything to me because my son was sick. I didn't know how sick he was. I didn't know what type of sickness he had. I just knew, man, my son's in trouble and I've got to, I've got to get there. And so I wasn't concerned with what that law was, was telling me. Because even though I would see the sign, it would catch my eye. Every time I looked in the rear view mirror, I seen the love I had for my son. And in my mind, I only had two choices, man, in my brain. Obey the law or break the law for love. Like that, that's how cut and dry it was for me. Now, now let me just say it really quick because I'm not gonna end up finishing the whole story because I'm going somewhere. Everything ended up fine. God healed my son. It was a miracle. It was amazing. We show up there. The gastros, they rush us. Emergency to Hershey. We show up. The, the gastro, whatever they're called, right? Specialists are going to do the surgery. They, they said, hey, I don't know what happened, but, but it fixed itself. I don't know. Must have fixed it. No, God healed him. So it was amazing. But listen, at that time, I didn't know any of this. The only thing I knew was Abishai was sick. He's my son, whom I love with all my heart. And I got to get him to the doctors. And so those speed limit signs didn't mean anything to me. I, I was going to break the law for love. That, that law was not going to, to, going to challenge my love for my son. It just wasn't going to happen. And so I was at, plus uh, most police officers that I know are pretty, pretty sympathetic to something like that. You're like, hey man, my son, they'll probably transport you. Typically they'll go in front of you. I probably should have called somebody first, but I was in a hurry. And so I wasn't worried about the speed limit sign. I was, I was willing to break the law for love. And as I was reading and studying about the Sabbath day, about the law of the Sabbath, I realized something, that God sort of did the same thing for us through his son, Jesus, except God didn't break a law for love. God fulfilled the law for love. Me, I broke it. God said, well, I can't break my own law, so let me fulfill the law. See, Jesus said this, he said, I came to not abolish the law, but to fulfill it. That word fulfill in the Greek means this, to bring a completion to it, to complete it in its full meaning, in its full context of the reason that this law was created, this day was created. That's what that, that word means. I came to fulfill, bring a completion. And see, before Jesus came, the Sabbath, the seventh day, was characterized as a religious law to observe a bunch of religious traditions. And in return, it caused the people of God to be bound to a law of a specific day. It created bondage in their life because religion can only bring forth bondage. It's all it can bring forth. It's relationship that brings forth love and freedom. And so Jesus, before he came, this law was, was binding the people. And he said, well, I come to fulfill it. I've, I've come to bring the actual meaning to the reason the Sabbath was created in the first place for the people of God. See, the people of God thought that they were meant to serve the Sabbath because of the law. But Jesus, he said, hold up, hold up. You, you have it all wrong. You guys have missed the entire boat. This thing isn't about a law. This thing is about a relationship with me. And in Mark chapter two, we find Jesus and his disciples and they're walking through a grain field. It's on the Sabbath day. And see, the law said that you couldn't pick or work during, you couldn't pick anything, you couldn't work in the fields on the Sabbath. 
So they couldn't pick something to eat because it was the Sabbath day. That was the law. But the disciples begin to pick heads of grain off and they start eating it. And the religious leaders say, why are you allowing your disciples to break the law of the Sabbath? And Jesus, he's so hard, by the way. He is just so hard. I love it. He says, hold up. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I created it. And I created Sab- the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. And then the next few verses, the very next few verses of Mark chapter 3, we find Jesus, he's in the temple, it's on the Sabbath. There's a man there who's sick, he's got a withered hand. He's never been able to use his hand, it's withered from birth. And he tells him, he says, stand up in front of everyone. Stand up, it's in the middle of the church, it's on the Sabbath day. And Jesus, he looks at all the religious leaders and the religious people in the room and he he says, what is lawful to do on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To give life, to save life, or to kill? Which is, is lawful? And so he tells the man, he says, hey, stretch out your hand, the one that is withered. Stretch it out. And immediately his hand was healed. But because these people's hearts were so bound up by a law, they couldn't see the love that the Father had created the Sabbath for. They couldn't see it. They missed the point of the Sabbath. (laughs) And so Jesus is showing us here that the Sabbath was created for us to rest in his love. That's what it's created for. See, I, I thought I had to break the law to show love, to prove my love. But God fulfilled the law, brought a completion to it to show his love to his people so that they would have an entire day just to rest in the love that they've experienced from the Father. What love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of the Most High God. We're to to rest in that, in the finished work, in the completed work of Jesus. Scripture says this, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, God proves his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How powerful is that? And the Sabbath was created for us to rest in that fact. (laughs) That it's not in our striving, it's not in our doing, it's in the finished and complete work of what the Father done through his son, Jesus. On the seventh day, He blessed it. He made it holy. He separated it. He said, I created it for for my people. So not only did he create the entire earth and put everything on the earth for his people, but then at the very end of it, he says, hey, let me bless this day and create a whole day of rest. Let Let me complete it with the day of completion to complete my people. It's amazing. This love that the Father has... For God so loved the entire world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life, that they would walk and they would rest in this love. Jesus says it this way. All of you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. This is what God is trying to show us through the seventh day, through all of creation, by finishing it with the Sabbath. The Sabbath was never created to carry a law, to bind the people of God. It was created for the people of God to rest in a relationship that they have with a God that created them and loved them, that sent his only son to die for them so that he can have a relationship with them. It's incredible. It's incredible. So look, from now on, from this day forward and every other day, because what's amazing now, because Jesus lives in us, the Sabbath doesn't have to be one day. It can be every single day that we can just walk in his love every day. It's incredible. Go ahead, stand to your feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Listen, maybe this morning you're thinking, what what are you talking about when you're talking about resting in his love? How how do I do that? 
Well, first of all, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, then you'll never experience the rest of Jesus. We have to give him our hearts. We have to give him our lives in order to experience the rest that comes with him. So I'm going to ask you really quickly here. I never like to close a service until I make sure that everyone in the room has had the opportunity to give their life to Jesus. And so if you've never given your life to the Lord, just right where you're at, just lift your hand really quickly. It's, it's just an outward declaration of, Lord, I want to serve you with my life. also I felt like when I was going through this that there's many people facing a lot of different things and you're finding a really hard time finding rest you're finding a really hard time to separate a day for him a time for him to, to spend with him really felt like the Lord just wanted to encourage us in his love today for you to find confidence in his love knowing that he created everything and every day for us to experience this great love that he has for us I just lift up every single person within the sound of my voice to you right now. And I pray for those who are far from you that you would draw them close to you. That they would fill you even now, whether they're seated at home in their living room was watching online. I pray that the Holy Spirit would invade their home right now. Or whether they're sitting right here in this sanctuary. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would invade their hearts and their minds even now. Give them a revelation of how real you are, how amazing you are, how wonderful you are, how the thoughts that you have towards them outnumber the grains of sand on the seashore. Let them sense that and know that even now as I pray. Lord, and I pray for the rest of us as we go through life and life has a lot going on. There's a ton of things happening in each and every one of our lives. I pray you would show us the way to your rest. Holy Spirit, lead us into the rest of the Son. Lord, I thank you for your word. We thank you for your, for your presence that is here. Lord, I speak a blessing over your people even now. Let them leave this place resting in your love, resting in what you've already done for them. That there's no longer striving. There's simply riding the wave that you've already created for them, riding the momentum of your saving grace, of your unfailing love. I pray that right now over each and every one of us. Let them know it this week as they go about their week. In Jesus' name. And everybody said. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. God bless you. Have an amazing week. We'll see you next week. Amen.